This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Our guests are Monique Hardin, environmental and human rights lawyer in New Orleans, uh, Gary Rivlin, author of Katrina After the Flood, and author and actor Wendell Pierce, The Wind in the Reeds, A Storm a Play in the City That Would Not Be Broken. Juan? Well, I want to go back to an infamous moment shortly after Hurricane Katrina, when the hip-hop star Kanye West spoke out against President Bush and NBC's nationally televised concert for hurricane relief. He was appearing alongside actor Mike Myers. This is Kanye West. With the breach of three levees protecting New Orleans, the landscape of the city has changed dramatically, tragically, and perhaps irreversibly. There's now over 25 feet of water where there was once city streets and thriving neighborhoods. I hate the way they portray us in the media. If you see a black family, it says they're looting. If you see a white family, it says they're looking for food. And you know it's been five days because most of the people are black. And even for me to complain about, I would be a hypocrite because I've tried to turn away from the teacher TV because it's too hard to watch. I've even been shopping before even giving a donation. So now I'm calling my business manager right now to see what's, what is the biggest amount I can give. And, and just to imagine if I was, if I was down there and those are, those are my people down there. So anybody out there that wants to do anything that we can help with, with the setup, the way America is set up to help the, um, uh, the poor, the, the black people, the, uh, the less well off as slow as possible. I mean, this is Red Cross is doing everything they can. We, we already realize a lot of the people that could help are at war right now, fighting another way. And they, they, they've given them permission to go down and shoot us. And subtle, but in even many ways more profoundly devastating, is the lasting damage to the survivors' will to rebuild and remain in the area. The destruction of the spirit of the people of southern Louisiana and Mississippi may end up being the most tragic loss of all. George Bush doesn't care about black people. That was Kanye West. And this is President Bush, later, who, who later wrote in his memoir that this moment was an all-time low of his presidency. He spoke about it in a 2010 interview with NBC's Matt Lauer. And I didn't appreciate it then. I don't, I don't appreciate it now. It's one thing to say, you know, I don't appreciate the way he's handled his business. It's another thing to say this man's a racist. I resent it. It's not true. And it was one of the most disgusting moments of my presidency. This from the book. I faced a lot of criticism as president. I didn't like hearing people claim that I lied about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction or cut taxes to benefit the rich. But the suggestion that I was racist because of the response to Katrina represented an all-time low. Yeah, still feel that way as, as you read those words. Felt them when I heard them, felt them when I wrote them, and I felt them when I'm listening to them. You say you told Laura at the time it was the worst moment of your presidency. Yeah. I wonder if, if some people are going to read that, and they might give you some heat for that. And the reason is this. I don't care. Well, here's the reason. You're not saying that the worst moment in your presidency was watching the misery in Louisiana. You're saying it was when someone insulted you because no, of it. No, and I also make it clear that the misery in Louisiana affected me deeply as well. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of tough moments in the book, and uh, it's a disgusting moment, pure and simple. That was President uh, George W. Bush in 2010. Uh, Monique Hardin, uh, your thoughts as you hear those clips? Well, um, you know, I, I think one of the, the, for me, I think it's important people understand that this is the same president that adopted a, a within the State Department, a policy for protecting human rights when people are displaced by a disaster in foreign countries. And the, with the understanding that if you don't ensure that they have the right to return, the right to recover, that, that destabilizing effect of displacement can create serious setbacks that can last several generations uh, uh, into the future. And you can go from destabilized people and families to destabilize communities and areas and regions uh, where the disaster and the displacement occurs. And so, to, to do that in uh, the year before Hurricane Katrina, and then to turn around and do the complete opposite, ignore the need for evacuation, ignore the need for preparation, ignore the, the tremendous need for recovery that's equitable and just and protects human rights, 
uh, is, is part of his legacy and is something that uh, he created. I mean, when you look at the federal law, all of the decisions come from the president. Once something is declared as a national disaster, this law says all decisions and the decision to act or not to act are entirely discretionary and immune from lawsuit. And this is how he chose to exercise that power, to let people wait and, and suffer in flooded cities on rooftops and convention centers and the Superdome without adequate support and services, to evacuate families without parents without children in a really inhumane and harsh condition, uh, and, to, and to set about this conservative recovery agenda caused the displacement of so many people, uh, African Americans in particular, from New Orleans and the Gulf region, and put money in the hands of folks who are, it, were, who are not in need of any uh, recovery, but are just profiting from the disaster. Wendell, he did all of that. Wendell I, Pierce, if you could uh, respond, where were you when you heard what Kanye West said? And then uh, you talked about your parents, uh, uh, among the first to uh, live in Pontchartrain, um, a, a, an African-American suburb uh, in New Orleans. But your history goes way back, grandparents, great-grandparents, a brief uh, biography of your family and its connections to New Orleans. Yeah, well, I was, uh, uh, I was in the middle of uh, St. James Parish, where we were um, where we rode out the storm. We were without power. We were in the middle of the storm at an uncle's uh, home. Um, and uh, I didn't see Kanye's, uh, um, uh, Kanye's um, uh, expression uh, on television in the, until later on. Um, but uh, getting back to what the president, President Bush, said, uh, that he was disgusted. I was truly disgusted. You know, the 82nd Airborne can be anywhere in the world in 48 hours, and they're in Georgia, just a couple of states away, a couple of miles away from New Orleans. Uh, I was disgusted when I watched the president of the United States fly over the disaster that was happening in New Orleans, rather than come there. You know, in 1965, during Betsy, uh, when I was a little boy, another devastating hurricane. Uh, uh, LBJ came down to the Lord Ninth War with a flashlight wading through the water saying, I am your president. I am here. Come out. We are here to do something for you. Uh, and it was just the stark contrast of a president who just was uh, just showed neglect. And to say that it wasn't about race, uh, I'm sure that I kept saying to people who finally got in touch with me in the middle of the night, um, and I would tell them, we are in great need down here. And they kept telling me, Wendell, we're watching it on television. And I said, you can't be telling me that you're watching it on television, because uh, it, there would be some response. And to find out later, once I got out of uh, Louisiana, to see that it was something that was broadcast around the world live. And those same people we saw at the convention center tried to walk out of the city, met on the other side of the bridge by uh, racist cops who shot into the crowd, over their heads, saying, go back. We don't want you to come into our community of Gretna, which is a white suburban uh, neighborhood uh, and city just across the bridge. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget how people responded to people of color. If those had been white American citizens, you would have seen a more immediate response. I doubt that if in the marina section of San Francisco after the earthquake, um, uh, uh, in, in the late 80s, that people would have sat back and done nothing. They knew that was one of the most cherished neighborhoods in America and one of the most cherished and profitable cities in America, and so they responded. It was all about race. The lack of attention, the fact that uh, uh, you, you saw these images of people in need. And so I, I think back to how my parents' generation uh, created Punchatrain Park, the neighborhood that I grew up in. Uh, it came out of that same sort of racist neglect. During the Jim Crow, you could only go to the park only one day of the week if you were black, and that was Wednesdays, Negro's Day, Negro Day. And Punchatrain Park was in response to that, after advocacy of the civil rights movement, so that we could have access to this post-World War II suburbia that was happening after the war. My father, who fought in World War II, came back, took advantage of the GI Bill and created Pontchartrain Park. 
a golf course, a thousand homes around it, where they would have access to what was that Levittown sort of suburbia that was happening in America. We were in some of the deepest part of the flooding, and we took it upon ourselves to initiate our own redevelopment. Resident initiated the Punch Train Park Community Development Corporation. So now if we have these homes and trying to bring people back. We're restricted by those who don't have our best interest at heart because we've turned away people with cash, saying, here we are, I want to buy a home in your community, come back, just like you, Wendell. I heard the call, this Joshua generation, honoring that Moses generation that gave us a great foundation, a great place to grow up in. And we have to turn away people with cash because of these policies that are restricting us from selling to any sort of middle class or working class uh, person who wants to come, because they're using our redevelopment to displace all of those uh, from public housing. So we're restricted to only take in those who are in need from public housing as they take back and reclaim the center of the city and other parts of the city that had public housing that they want. I call it the new blight, because two-thirds of it sits empty at market rate, where you have only one-third that is public housing. So you see over the course of generation and generation and generation racist policies that are not in the best interest of communities that are doing everything possible to thrive on their own. And so you have to be ever vigilant. From my grandparents' generation, where people were coming, uh, night riders coming and burning cars in the black community uh, in, in, in Assumption Parish, to my mother's generation and my parents' generation who, who brought us up in Pontchartrain Park. And now, as we mark this 10-year anniversary of Katrina, the most profound thing about this commemoration is the fact that we have another window of opportunity to get it right. And while some people have said that I am a voice of cynicism, that I am not being as celebratory as everyone else, you're absolutely right, because I choose to look at what is going wrong and saying we have an opportunity now to attack those issues and those policies that are going to have a negative impact, and let's try to bring back those people who want to come home, that 100,000 displaced New Orleanians who love New Orleans. And being a culture uh, uh, matron, uh, as an actor, um, to know that most of the culture you're familiar with in New Orleans comes from that history of, of, uh, uh, of oppression and, and is known around the world. Second lines were because black communities were redlined by insurance companies, so we put together our own social aid and pleasure clubs. You understand the pleasure part. The social aid was to make sure that we pooled our monies so that Five we seconds. can take care of ourselves. So that's the thing that I want to remember the most, the legacy of the culture that came before, the fighting uh, those that don't have our best interests at heart. Wendell and Pierce, I want to thank— looking forward to the future. I want to thank you for—